Now, you asked early on in the show why he's not as well known as other prohibitionary yeah. gangsters and bootleggers. It's because he didn't cause the same kind of murder and mayhem that they did. <laughs> That's yeah, why. That, that well, he sense. was responsible yeah. for murder, but not... He wasn't, I mean... It he wasn't, wasn't systematic was, gang yes, murder. That's yeah. right. That's why he's not as well known. He didn't generate the headlines for murders and shootings and Tommy guns and all that. That's why he he's more known for uh, his uh, entrepreneurial flair and uh, that kind of thing. He's not, yeah, not for his violence, apart from that one incident. The legends of America's mobs are woven into the fabric of society and pop culture. We've all seen the movies or heard the tales of these criminal organizations. Their stories of power, wealth, respect, family, greed, betrayal, violence, murder, and mayhem. While the golden age of the mobs may be over, organized crime continues to thrive, and the stories remain as infamous as ever. You're listening to the Gangland History Podcast, hosted by mob historian Jacob Stoops. He tells the true crime biographies of real-life mobsters and dives deep into the plots, subplots, and real facts behind organized crime in America. Viewer discretion is advised. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of the Gangland History Podcast, formerly the Members Only Podcast. Uh, I'm probably a few episodes away from just foregoing saying that any any further, but I'll keep saying it for the next few episodes for uh, those new listeners. Uh, we've got a, a great show today, uh, and we're bringing back a former guest, which officially, I'm just going to say, when a, when a guest has been on more than once, they officially become a, a friend of the show. Uh, so we're bringing back Tony Toke today uh, to continue our Lawyers series. And this one in particular is not uh, is a lawyer, not a mob lawyer per se, but is a lawyer, uh, but is a, a really, really interesting and fascinating and really underrated character from the the days of prohibition, Mr. George Remus. But before we get into him, uh, let's say hi to Tony. Hi, Jake. How you going? Uh, you know, things are going, things are going quite well, uh, quite well, uh, you know, just really speeding, <laughs> speeding up content. I've promised my audience will, uh, pick up the pace with, with content and we're doing that. We're interspersing interviews, which I've, I've certainly enjoyed. We've got a really good one coming up with Mr. Gary Jenkins, uh, of the gangland wire podcast. So, uh, I'm excited. And probably by the time this gets released, that one will, <laughs> will have already gotten, uh, released, but as of as of now, when we're recording, it's in the final stages of editing. Uh, but very, very uh, excited and very excited to uh, to talk about our subject today, uh, George Remus, who was dubbed the the king of the bootleggers. So, uh, before we get into the episode, I'd just like to remind everybody, uh, you know, definitely subscribe if you can, turn on the bell to hit notifications, leave a comment. I love interacting with my audience. If you're listening on the audio only version, certainly go over to Apple, leave a review, good, bad, or ugly. I'm willing to, to take any and all feedback or rating. Uh, certainly helps me from an algorithm standpoint. Uh, and be on the lookout. Uh, we've restood up our, our merch store. So we've got some Gangland History Podcast merch out there. Uh, and we're also working on the Patreon channel still and still working on converting over the website. So a lot of things under construction here, but we're still producing content. Uh, and, you know, why don't we just, uh, let's just jump right in. Let's jump right in. Um, so, Tony, why don't you tell us a little bit about uh, Remus? Let's let's give an overview and then let's talk about, you know, his background, where he was born and, and where he grew up. And we'll just kind of get into it. Well, he was born in Germany in 1876. Some sources give his birth year as 1878. His family immigrated to the U.S. when he was about five years old. They, they briefly lived in Baltimore and Milwaukee, and then they finally settled in the bustling city of Chicago. Uh, Remus was forced to become the breadwinner at the young age of 14 because his father suffered from rheumatism and he was also an alcoholic. He quit school and he uh, got a job as a clerk 
in his uh, uncle's pharmacy in Chicago. Now, he was unsatisfied, and this is a common theme in his life, he was unsatisfied with just doing manual jobs at the pharmacy. So he enrolled in pharmacy school and received a pharmacist's license at the age of 19. By 21, he bought his first pharmacy and then he bought another one within five years. So he was quite smart, ambitious and savvy from an early age. And he would display these traits throughout his whole life. Yeah, he was uh, definitely an, an entrepreneur. Uh, and, you know, the funny thing is he shows up in the series Boardwalk Empire. And, you know, it's unfortunate because they kind of make him look like a bit of an oaf. Uh, he has this character trait where he repeats himself uh, over and over and also talks uh, about himself in the third person. Yes. And you would you would think that that would be something that they would just dub in. And we'll get to this. We'll get to this later. It's actually true. We did do that. Yes. Did do that. I found uh, interviews from the 1920s where he's giving a statement to press reading the entire thing in uh, referring to himself in third person. It's actually quite, quite hilarious. So they didn't just do that, do that yes. by accident. Um, but he's definitely an entrepreneur and somebody that comes uh, you know, that, that is, is going to use all of these things that he begins to attain over the course of time, like his pharmacy uh, license and his experience in, in pharmaceuticals. They're really going to benefit him uh, later on, later on in life. Uh, so, Tony, uh, how did Mr. Uh, Mr. Remus end up becoming a lawyer? He became, began studying law at night school and he completed a three-year course in 18 months. And in 1900, at the age of 24, he was admitted to the Illinois Bar. His mentor was legendary criminal defense attorney uh, Clarence Darrow. I'm sure all lawyers are familiar with that name. Uh, he's famous for the Scopes Monkey trial and the uh, Loeb and Leopold murder case. He's like the iconic lawyer, like... Um, like when lawyers are giving it to each other, just having a chat, they're like, what do you think you are, Clarence Darrow? <laughs> kind of yeah. like that, yeah. Uh, in 1914, uh, he got national attention for his role. This is George I'm talking about, George Remus. He got national attention for his role as defense attorney in the William Cheney Alice murder trial. Now, yeah. Alice was charged with killing his wife in a jealous rage. Uh, Remus put up an unheard defense called... Transitory insanity, that's the precursor, precursor to what we call now call temporary insanity. He advanced the theory that Alice had repeatedly stabbed his wife until she died while in a jealous rage and then went to sleep. And then when he woke up, he claimed that he didn't remember committing the crime at all. In short, basically, he suffered, suffered a total blackout and was completely oblivious to the crime. The Alice trial lasted about three weeks and... Alice was convicted of murder and sentenced to 15 years in uh, prison. Uh, that's a relatively light sentence in the circumstances because he was facing the death penalty. In another case, and this is a funny one, his client was facing the death penalty for poisoning his wife. Now, the jury watched in shock as Remus drank from a bottle of poison that his client supposedly used to kill his oh, wife. God. Now, <laughs> when Remus didn't drop dead from the poison, the jury voted to acquit him. Uh, acquit, the, acquit his client, uh, the jury wasn't aware that Remus, who was a pharmacist, of course, had taken the antidote before drinking the poison. So he became somewhat famous for these kind of theatrics and managed to build a reputation in Chicago as a very effective lawyer. So he sounds like he had maybe a, a, a little bit of a screw, screw loose as, yeah. as well, but definitely creative uh, in terms of coming up with that sort of a defense when it was at that point in time, unheard of. And I, I did a little bit of digging on the the Ellis case. And, and quite frankly, it's a little bit shocking that he was able to get him off uh, to only 15 years. Um, so, you know, looking at some old newspaper articles, this is something I love to do. I love going back and looking like, you know, back at a window in time. So I found an, a, a newspaper article out of the Modesto B. Um, uh, from February 20th, 1914, which is, again, I love this kind of stuff. And it says that the, when the police discovered, uh, the, you know, the body in the, in the murder, uh, of Mrs. Ellis, uh, essentially they had heard a, a disturbance and, and they were going to, to check on the disturbance in the, the Chicago hotel. And so when they walk in the room, they see, 
uh, Mr. Ellis uh, with blood gushing from a wound in his neck and two slashes across the wrist. So, of course, indicating a struggle. And Mrs. Ellis laying dead on the bed with a gaping hole in her neck and two bullet holes in her breast. And police, when they entered the room, initially thought that it was a, a suicide pact. But, you know, when they started looking at the evidence, they quickly realized that there was no way Mrs. Ellis could have killed herself. Uh, and as they were doing, you know, some of the investigations, especially right on the right on the spot, he was this being Mr. Ellis was making claims that she was unfaithful to him pretty like coherently yes. making making these claims. Uh, and all of this came out in testimony, yet uh, Remus was able to be creative enough to. Uh, to think of a, a solution to get his client off relatively lightly when quite frankly he the the client uh was caught pretty much red handed uh murdering murdering his wife should have gone away for life, maybe even you know the death penalty uh at that point in time so that was definitely definitely an instance that just shows how smart Remus was yes. and the thing that we're about to to talk about next. And um, especially if you read Wiki, uh, Wikipedia and again, Wikipedia is not the source I use for most of my information, most of my information. It's just sometimes good to, to look at, to get a broad overview. One of the lines you'll see is that the inspiration for the character um, uh, in the great Gatsby, which I think we know today is, is primarily based off of Arnold Rothstein, was also uh, rumored to be in part based on George Remus. Uh, and, uh, sorry, was... just um, uh, I actually studied The Great Gatsby in high school. And, really? Uh, so I'm very familiar <laughs> with the book. We studied yeah. it for a whole year. Uh, I have to correct you there. Uh, you know, um, another character was based on Maya, uh, on uh, Arnold Rothstein. There was a character called Maya Wolfsheen. And, okay, all right. And, yep, and... There Jay Gatsby, the lead character, was based on uh, George Remus, allegedly, although okay, my English teacher never mentioned any of these characters at the time. All she spoke about was how good-looking uh, Robert Redford was when he played the, the, <laughs> that role in the 1974 movie. Well, you know what? Yeah, uh, that's, I'm, I'm glad you said that, and that just actually... Uh, Proves sometimes uh, how inaccurate sources yeah, like that's Wikipedia, right. yeah. Wikipedia can be, and I, you know, I, I definitely don't, uh, don't claim to know everything. So, yeah, no, certainly no offense taken. I'm, I'm wrong from, from time to time, but that's okay. I think the fact, the fact remains that Remus was a bit of a, a Renaissance man. So, yes. it, you know, you know, in the in the uh, early uh, 1900s, uh, after be being a pharmacist, he he becomes a becomes a lawyer uh and you know he he's very a very educated person he's very entrepreneurial and this leads him into bootleg bootlegging uh and of course right at this time this is when prohibition uh towards the uh the end of the the 19 teens i guess they're called um so considering his background in education how did he get into bootlegging how does one go from lawyer to bootlegger well jake when prohibition went into effect in 1920 with the passing of the volstead act uh remus began defending a lot of bootleggers and was making over five hundred thousand dollars a year now that's the equivalent to almost seven million dollars today as he was defending these bootleggers he noticed that a lot of them were just vulgar uneducated often just downright stupid yet they were making truckloads of money now on one particular occasion he was representing a bootlegger in court and he was struck at how unfazed his client was when, he, when the presiding judge ordered that he pay a $10,000 fine for violating the Volstead Act. That's equivalent to about $160,000 today. You'd expect a client to just faint and go into a panic mode if they, if they got a fine like that. But he was just unfazed. He was happy to pay it. He just moved on. Apparently, that's when he decided he was missing out on the real action and decided to become a bootlegger. But Remus was an educated and sophisticated guy, as we've seen. And he wasn't a violent criminal, so he couldn't just shoot his way into the market like other famous Prohibition-era gangsters. And he wasn't interested in copying other bootleggers by just smuggling alcohol from places like Canada and Cuba. Uh, his unique background in, as a pharmacist and lawyer gave him an edge over wannabe bootleggers and gangsters, and he wanted to take advantage of that. And he 
like to go off the beaten path. He was a pioneer, just like as a lawyer when he pioneered the temporary insanity defence. Um, he liked to do things for the first time, be you know a groundbreak, groundbreaking kind of entrepreneur. So he turned his mind to exploiting the loopholes in the Volstead Act. He carefully read through the Volstead Act, apparently to the point where he memorised it, and he discovered some interesting loopholes. Now, Title II, Section 6 of the Volstead Act permitted the dispensing of alcohol subject to a doctor's prescription for medicinal purposes with a government-issued licence. Another section of the Volstead Act, Title II, Section 3, stipulated that existing stocks of alcohol that had been manufactured before prohibition were private property and should remain stored in warehouses. Remus decided, okay, why don't I just buy the entire stockpile of pre-prohibition alcohol and just sell it? So he closed his law practice, liquidated his assets, and moved to Cincinnati, Ohio with his family and set up his bootlegging operation there. Now, there are a number of reasons why he chose Cincinnati. I'm not familiar with Cincinnati at all. I've never been there. Well, but I'm, I'm very familiar with Cincinnati. <laughs> Um, yeah, so being, uh, I don't think I've ever actually said where I'm from. I'm, I've said I'm a, I'm, I'm a Midwest guy. I'm from Ohio. Uh, and, uh, you know, I'm not from Cincinnati per se. I'm a little, uh, more towards Cleveland. Uh, love my, love my Cleveland teams. That's in the Northern part of Ohio, but, uh, have been to Cincinnati many, many times have family from, from Cincinnati, uh, have been right across the river to Covington and, and Newport, uh, and I don't know, like if you were planning on getting into this, but uh, the interesting thing about Cincinnati is nobody would think about it, uh, in the sense that it was a big hub for prohibition, right? You think of all the big cities and, and Cincinnati is not a small city, but it's not New York. It's not Chicago. It's not Los Angeles. It's not any of the, the really big ones, nor is it really thought of as having a history of organized crime. But if you know anything about the area as it stands today, and, and specifically as you get across the river in Kentucky, because Cincinnati is right on the Ohio River, uh, you know that Kentucky is known for the bourbon trail. Even today, Kentucky is known for the, the bourbon trail. And the interesting thing, and I'm sure you're about to cover this, is Cincinnati is centrally located in the Midwest, uh, about equidistant to Chicago, New York, and kind of all the main places that you uh, that you need to need to go. I think it's within a 300 mile radius of uh, the the statistic I read was uh, located within a 300 mile radius of 80 percent of all of America's bonded whiskeys, uh, which made it ideal for for bootlegging. So Remus was uh, smart. <laughs> he was smart. I probably just stole your thunder a little bit, but Remus- That's the main was reason. Smart. That was the first reason. Yeah. Yes, that's correct. The second reason was being based out of Cincinnati uh, meant there was less competition than Chicago, where bootleggers were running wild and shooting each other. Uh, Remus had briefly dabbled in bootlegging in Chicago, but he quickly realized that he'd missed the train because Chicago was already divided into established territories for distribution and sale of alcohol. On the south side, you had Italian mobsters like Johnny Torrio. And on the north side, you had Irish mobsters like Dion O'Banion. So there wasn't much room for maneuver there. He decided it was better to be a big fish in a small pond uh, instead of the other way around. Thirdly, Cincinnati had a very large German-American population who loved to drink and hated prohibition. So that was, uh, those are the reasons. Uh, around this time, he left his first wife and he uh, remarried a woman named Imogene Holmes. She was a young divorcee with a daughter. Now, Imogene was what we would call today the gold digger type. She was eager to become rich and famous and quickly realised that uh, an ambitious man like George Remus was her ticket. And, uh, you know, when it comes to the bootlegging side of things and, and we'll, we'll certainly get into the, uh, the, the, the wife, uh, because she has a big role to play in Remus's life. Uh, but when it comes to the bootlegging side of things, Remus eventually gets so big that he's become known as the king of the bootleggers. So what would you say made him so successful? 
He didn't build his empire using systematic violence and murder like other gangsters of the era. Instead, he relied on his brains and meticulous planning. When he moved to Cincinnati, he created a highly sophisticated bootlegging operation known as the Circle that was bigger than Al Capone's even. It went something like this. First, he would buy the closed distilleries and gain possession of the vast stocks of bonded whiskey that were held in the warehouses. Now, the owners would happily sell the distilleries in stock because as far as they were concerned, the alcohol industry was dead, or so they thought. Secondly, he would purchase wholesale pharmaceutical companies so that he would have control of the dispensing of the prescribed medicinal whiskey. Now, this was pretty easy because you've got to remember he was a pharmacist, so running a pharmaceutical company didn't raise any suspicions with the government. Thirdly, he would use contacts in Washington, D.C. to obtain these government permits so that he could legally remove the bonded whiskey from their warehouses and then legally sell the whiskey to his pharmaceutical companies for legal sale and distribution for medicinal purposes. Then fourthly, and most importantly, he set up this transportation company and then he'd arrange for his own group of men to hijack his own trucks, steal the whiskey barrels, and then sell them as bootleg whiskey for an enormous profit. Uh, that whiskey would then be diverted to a 50-acre farm known as Death Valley. Now, the terrain leading to that farm was very rough and it was protected by armed guards. It was like a fortress. Uh, from there, he would ship the illegal whiskey at high prices to nearby states, generating enormous profits. He employed like 3,000 workers working three shifts a day and had politicians, prohibition agents, federal marshals, on, federal marshals on his payroll. And he took pride in selling high quality product, whereas other bootleggers were only interested in making profits. And they just often they watered down their product. And in some cases, the bootleg product, and you probably read this happened a lot during prohibition. It was so bad that it caused alcohol poisoning or methanol poisoning. By late, late, yes. By late 1921, he controlled or he controlled or owned nine distilleries and owned over 35 percent of all the whiskey barrels in the United States. His gross revenues from this trade exceeded 50 million dollars, which would be equivalent to almost 800 million dollars today. So, I mean, he was he was. Uh pushing a billion dollars, <laughs> tapping, yes. uh, you know, largely into an untapped market. Uh, you know, if, if you weren't in the big city, uh, well, the, people outside of the big city wanted to drink too, <laughs> right? In fact, I think prohibition was so unpopular by a certain point, everybody wanted to, wanted to have a drink and, and was finding a way to do it. And they needed somebody to serve that, serve that need. And well, in the Midwest, uh, George Remus was your was your guy. And I, I think, uh, you know, one thing that's interesting about, you know, when you start to think about uh, the show Boardwalk Empire is it shows Remus as having connections with some of the biggest gangsters, uh, you know, the, in history, uh, you know, with the Capones, with the Lucianos and in, in, in doing a little bit of historical research. I read a lot of read a lot of books, read a lot of information. I think one of the interesting things is from time to time, I have come across stories of of uh, very significant mobsters, including Luciano, spending a little bit of time in in Cincinnati, Ohio, which is not a place you would expect them to be. It's way outside of their hub. And well, the reason to be in Cincinnati was Remus, for sure, during the Prohibition era. Now, Remus was also a really flamboyant character. Isn't that right? Yeah, that's right, uh, Jake. He um, he made all that money and he loved to spend it, that's for sure. He used his vast wealth to purchase this mansion called the Marble Palace. It was furnished with all this expensive artwork, sculptures, and it had a huge indoor marble swimming pool. Uh, he would also host extravagant parties at the mansion, attended by members of high society, politicians, and funnily enough, law enforcement officials who somehow turned a blind eye to all the alcohol flowing at the parties. Uh, he became legendary for his hospitality and generosity like this. And unlike other rich people who's actually, who were very aloof and snobby, he, was, he would allow like children from the neighbourhood to come and play in his yard and use his pool. Um, at his 1921 New Year's Eve party, every man who attended was given a diamond stick pin and every woman was given a brand new Pontiac motor vehicle. So... <laughs> 
he was extremely generous and um, I think that's why the whole inspiration for Jay Gatsby in the uh, Fitzgerald's famous 1924 novel, The Great Gatsby, comes in. Uh, people think that because there are, they say that he might have met him at some stage in Kentucky and that's what might have inspired him. Now, uh, interestingly, despite his flamboyant lifestyle, he never drank alcohol. I think this is because he was traumatised from uh, growing up with an alcoholic father, most likely. Uh, so, yeah, he was uh, extremely generous and hospitable, giving away well, my, uh, cars yeah. for, as a I gift mean, when you have that kind of money, <laughs> he's yeah. giving, away, giving away cars. Uh, when you have that kind of money, I guess, you you know, you can't, can't take it with you when you die, for sure. Well, I can't um, say Warren Buffett does the same thing. <laughs> He's very yes. frugal with his money. Yeah, that's it, it's it's so interesting, and and when you think of that, it almost makes him seem like a you know like a good a good person. Um, and it makes me wonder, you know, I've wondered why he doesn't get more play than he does in terms of his place in history. You don't often hear people talking about Remus and he's a really fascinating character, but at a certain point, we talked about his wife earlier. Um, things started to fall apart for him, didn't they? Yeah. Well, it's pretty hard for federal officials not to notice this enormous bootlegging operation that was going on on an industrial scale across the US. Yeah. So by late 1921, he had a meeting with 44 of his men to work out some logistics in relation to his illegal operation in the Cincinnati Hotel. And these the attendees included politicians, prohibition agents and federal marshals. And that meeting was bugged by the Prohibition Bureau. And then agents raided his farm at Death Valley. Uh, Remus was arrested and charged with 3,000 counts of violating the Volstead Act. But he wasn't overly concerned because he was supposed to be immune from federal prosecution because he'd corrupted a high official in the Department of Justice called Jess Smith. And this guy was a close associate of the then, then Attorney General in Warren Harding's administration in Washington. Uh, Warren Harding's administration was quite yeah, well known for being corrupt. President, yeah. And, well, yes. and th this storyline is in Boardwalk Empire yes. uh, to some degree. And, yes. um, uh, yeah, Je uh, Jess Smith, or I'm sorry, is Jess Smith, right? I, I'm bad yeah. with names. Yes. Yeah. He, he's, he's in there and I forget the yeah. actor who, uh, who plays him, but he's a pretty famous, famous actor. Definitely a, a, a story that they didn't dive deep into, but they definitely told it in, in Boardwalk Empire. <laughs> and yeah. I, I love that show. So I, you know, I like to connect reality to, you know, what you're seeing in, in, uh, some of the shows and, and try to bring a, a little bit of color to like what is truth and what is fiction, uh, within the, within the shows. So he quickly developed, the, he, he set up a million dollar defense fund and hired six high priced lawyers Mm -hmm. uh, but ultimately he was found guilty of conspiring to violate the Volstead Act. Now, for almost two years after that, he appealed his conviction all the way to the Supreme Court, and throughout this time, uh, Jess Smith kept assuring him, don't worry about anything, just uh, exhaust every legal avenue, and at the end of it, I'll arrange a pardon. So just, you know, don't stress. But then uh, Jess Smith decides to commit suicide, and uh, mm -hmm. Remus was left exposed. So he loses his appeal to the Supreme Court, and he began serving a two-year sentence at the Federal Penitentiary in Atlanta in 1925. Now, on his way to prison, he passed the time by reading Dante's Inferno. I think that was a sign of things to come because by this point, he was well and truly on a highway to hell, and we'll see that shortly. Yeah, he, uh, he definitely was. Uh, and his wife, uh, Imogene, would end up playing a really big part in his downfall. Yes. And uh, the story is quite shocking uh yes. and it ties back actually to his career uh, at the end it does tie back to his career earlier as a lawyer and uh so why don't we get into to what happened there because it's pretty much the the seminal point in his life it's when the plot thickens that's for sure uh, no. as the authorities were closing in on him remus had transferred his house and his bank accounts into his wife imogene's name also, when he left for prison, he gave Imogene a power of attorney which gave her control over all his assets and his entire operation. Now, while he was in prison, 
He told another inmate, another inmate about this power of attorney to his wife. That inmate turned out to be an undercover, undercover prohibition agent called Franklin Dodge Jr. And this prohibition agent was tasked with gathering intelligence about Remus's huge bootlegging operation. Dodge was so stunned by the extent of Remus's wealth that he decided to resign his job as a prohibition agent and started an affair with uh, Remus's wife, Imogen. Then together they plundered his assets, tried to have him deported, and even hired a hitman to kill him for $15,000. Now, the hitman didn't go through with the job and went and warned Remus. After he was released from prison and returned to Cincinnati, he discovered that Imogene and her lover had removed all the furniture, artwork, and artifacts from the Marble Palace. The only thing they left behind pretty much was the uh, paint on the walls. As you'd expect, he was furious and he started plotting his revenge. Around this time, he started acting a bit odd around people. He um, started saying weird things, acting like a bit of a buffoon, um, and people started to question his sanity at that point. Um, then, uh, and Imogene had commenced divorce proceedings against him. Now, the hearing was supposed to take place on the 6th of October, 1927, and they were both on their way separately to attend that hearing. Remus uh, saw her car in traffic. He made his chauffeur catch up with the taxi that she was riding in and block its way. When she realised what was happening, Imogene jumped out of the taxi and ran hysterically into a nearby park called Eden Park. Mm -hmm. uh, Remus leapt from the car and he ran after her. When he caught up with her, he shot her dead in front of a crowd of onlookers that included Imogene's daughter, Ruth. Uh, he then turned himself into the authorities and was charged with first-degree murder. Yeah, and that is um, certainly, a, certainly a harrowing, harrowing tale, tale for, for sure. He shoots his wife in in front of onlookers literally in front of uh, in front of everybody uh and you know this of course this this murder leads to him getting getting arrested and going going to trial uh very very soon after within a month he's he's uh he's going to trial uh and what happened at his murder trial because i believe that in terms of his legacy what actually transpired is is equally important to his his story. It was pretty much the O.J. Simpson trial of the 1920s. That's the best way yep. to describe it. It was covered by every major newspaper and hundreds of people stood in line at the courthouse hoping for admission to see the trial. He represented himself in this six-week trial and he pleaded not guilty on the grounds of temporary insanity. He used the same arguments that he pioneered when he was a uh, lawyer back in Chicago. He argued that he suffered from temporary insanity at the time that he fired the gun. He was facing the death penalty, so there was no room for error, and there were plenty of witnesses that saw it, so it's pretty hard, hard to argue that away. Uh, he brought in friends and colleagues to testify how his mental condition had deteriorated in the lead-up to the murder, and they spoke about his increasingly odd behaviour after he was betrayed by Imogene. Now, in response, prosecutors brought in three psychiatric experts to examine Remus and Rabadi's claim of insanity. Uh, Remus portrayed himself as a man constantly in fear of betrayal and murder since his release from prison. He conducted this elaborate smear campaign against Imogene and her lover and persuaded the jury that he was a victim of a carefully conceived plot that robbed him of his dignity and his fortune and just left him completely mentally unbalanced and... So the prosecution brought out their star witness, Imogene's daughter, Ruth, who was there uh, when, when her mother was murdered. Um, now, she got up on the stand and she tearfully recalled in graphic detail how we shot her mother. But none of it worked because after deliber deliberating for only 19 minutes, the 19, jury returned a verdict. Minutes. Yes, just 19 <laughs> minutes. That's they, a long time. <laughs> They returned a verdict of not guilty by reason of insanity. And even the presiding judge was stunned by this verdict. He was very unhappy about wow. it. So he decided to commit Remus to a mental asylum. It's the See, state hospital for the criminal and criminally insane. Now, Remus appealed the decision to commit him to the asylum. And ironically, he relied on the prosecution's psychiatric evidence from the murder trial to prove that he wasn't insane. And he was released after only seven months. So he, he they, was just phenomenal. Like, yeah, he's a genius. Uh, definitely a genius. And I think 
what's likely is he was working the system behind the scenes. He had the money to uh, uh, to do so, even though I- Imogene uh, sounds like control controlled <laughs> a lot of his a lot of his assets in terms of the the big decisions. But uh, but he had the money if he wanted to uh, to control things behind the scenes. And I think uh, uh, for the jury to take 19 minutes to only 19 minutes to make a decision is is evidence that there was probably something going on. He serves his time uh, again for those familiar uh, with the state of Ohio in Lima, Ohio, at a at yeah. a institution in Lima, Ohio. And I did want to get back to his uh, his odd behavior uh, right before the right before the trial. And I'm just I'm going to read it verbatim because it does prove the fact that he he did refer to himself in the third person, which again is his defining character trait in in boardwalk empire <laughs> just gonna be another minute what's hurting him now got an earache mr torio is a man beset by convenient maladies what's that mean Nothing cures him faster than someone else doing his laundry. I ain't his washerwoman. <laughs> Don't take it personally, kid. What do you think George Remus spent five years doing? Come again? I said, what do you think George Remus was doing for him? Ain't you George Remus? Who'd you think I was? You just said it like it was someone else. This shyster. Had him on a $500 retainer. Keep me out of the whole scowl. Cheaper lawyer, more time in jail. Why the fuck you moved to Cincinnati? Well, John, draw a circle 300 miles around. Know what you get? 300 miles of cow shit. <laughs> and 80% of the bonded whiskey being stored in this country. And part of me wonders if it started before or if it started as a way, as as an act leading into the trial to show that he had begun to act peculiar, peculiarly. <laughs> um, so I'm just going to read it. This is a report from November 4th, 1927, out of the Kentucky Post and Times Star. And it is, uh, it is quoting George Remus directly. So uh, this is Remus talking to, to, uh, to a reporter. Quote, George Remus, the attorney, not the bootlegger or the man who has been in 10 prisons, but the attorney will plead his own case when he goes to trial on the charge of murdering his wife. Talking to himself in the third person, George Remus, nationally known as the millionaire king of bootleggers, made this assertion Thursday in his cell in the Hamilton County Jail. George Remus cannot sit quiet at this trial, he said. George Remus is the man on trial for murder. It is the trial for George Remus's life. George Remus has more at stake than anyone else in this case. His flashing eyes showed he could not be shaken in in his stand. George Remus is preparing himself both physically and in study for this case, he continued. (laughs) I'm I'm not going to go on, but like it's literally George Remus, George Remus, George Remus. And it's all him talking, (laughs) talking to him uh, about himself to a reporter and i can it's it's odd even today um you know i just i just i find it funny to be able to to actually go back and look at some of these old news articles and prove that that character trait which you would think would have been thrown in uh as a way to kind of make him stand out and make him make him seem funny or a bit odd it, it's true uh, it's yeah. absolutely absolutely yep. true all right remus is finished Give us a minute. Um, so again, uh, you know, after the murder trial, uh, Remus eventually gets out. And uh, how did he? How did he spend the rest of his days? Well, he tried to re-enter bootlegging, but he was unsuccessful because in his absence, uh, violent gangsters had taken over the market, and there was no more room for competition. He moved to Kentucky to that town you mentioned over the river. I think it's Covington. 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 Yes, he. Uh, He opened a real estate office and lived out the rest of his life quietly. And uh, he spent a lot of time trying to reclaim the property that he lost, that Imogene and her partner had plundered. But as you'd expect, there wasn't much left over to recover. Uh, He died died at home of natural causes in 1952 at the age of uh, 77. 
Now, it's clear that he was a genius and he was phenomenally ambitious. I have little doubt that if George Remus didn't turn to crime, he would have gone down in history as a business tycoon or captain of industry along the lines of Vanderbilt, Rockefeller or Carnegie. It's the ultimate cautionary tale that crime doesn't pay. Now, the best book, uh, in my opinion, about George Remus is The Bourbon King by Bob Batchelor. I've got it here. That came out about five years ago. It's actually quite a good read. It goes into a lot of detail about his life uh, and crimes and his downfall and everything. So that's what I would recommend if you want to look into his uh, life a bit further. Yeah, and we will uh, we'll drop that link uh, in the description for those of you that are big book readers uh, like myself. Uh, but again, this was uh, such an interesting story. I like to talk about people that you don't hear about often. My podcast has been primarily mafia. This is part of the reason that I rebranded to the Gangland History Podcast to talk about other stories on the fridge, fringes uh, of criminality and not just the, the American Mafia. And George Remus was definitely one of those stories that I wanted to tell. Fascinated about the the history of uh, prohibition and bootlegging, all of that stuff just just fascinates me. It's it's a similar tale in just about every city, every big city across uh, across America at the time. Uh, and George Remus was a central player, so uh, both Tony and I felt like it was a story kind of worth telling. Uh, Tony, any uh, any closing remarks before we hop off? Now you asked early on in the show why he's not as well known as other prohibition era yeah. gangsters and bootleggers. It's because he didn't cause the same kind of murder and mayhem that they did. That's yeah, why. That, that well, he sense. was responsible yeah. for murder, but not, he wasn't, I mean. It he wasn't, wasn't systematic was, gang yes, murder. That's yeah. right. That's why he's not as well known. He didn't generate the headlines for murders and shootings and Tommy guns and all that. That's why he, he's more known for uh, his uh, entrepreneurial flair and, uh, that kind of thing. He's not, yeah, not for his violence, apart from that one incident. Okay, Apparently that yeah. was the only time he ever shot a gun. Really? Yes. Well, I guess he did it. He did it right. Yes. Uh, unfortunately for, for his wife. Yes. Um, well, yeah, let's, uh, let's go ahead and close the episode again. Tony, thank you for, for coming on. Uh, again, this yeah. is the, the second part in a multi-part series. We're going to come back and uh, in the future talk about another mob lawyer. I think it's an interesting angle uh, to cover. There are certainly plenty of good, uh, you know, good attorneys out there to cover who have interesting stories in connection with the mob. There's still a Still a lot to a lot to cover, and we are not done. Uh, if you enjoyed the episode, please engage me with a comment. I love uh, talking to my audience on YouTube, so drop a comment. Uh, if you're listening in the audio version, again, what I would just say is specifically with Apple because it does reviews, go leave me a review. Uh, if you're on Spotify, you can follow. There's all kinds of awesome stuff. Uh, and yeah, as I uh, as I end every episode, I'll just say, grazie. Thank you for listening to the Gangland History Podcast. If you'd like to donate to the show, check out our Patreon channel. If you're watching on YouTube, please hit like and subscribe to help the channel grow. If you're an audio-only listener, subscribe via Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, or anywhere you get your podcasts. Until next time, don't forget to keep your mouth shut.